In this video, I'll present the derivation of the finite volume formulation for one-dimensional unsteady heat transfer. We'll use specific boundary conditions of a heat flux at one side and a convection boundary condition on the other side. So here's the problem that we're going to solve. We can have an arbitrary length L. Uh, we're going to have a heat flux coming into the surface at x equals 0, or on the left-hand side, and we'll have a convection boundary condition on the right-hand side, or at x equals L. Uh, with a convection coefficient and ambient temperature. We'll assume a constant uh, conductivity, and we'll assume that the cross-sectional area is constant. We'll also assume that there's no generation within the bar, within the object. So we're going to break it up into finite volume formulation. We're going to break it up into equal control volumes of a dimension delta x, and we'll have, uh, in this example, five identical volumes uh, through the bulk of the material, and then we'll have two boundary volumes, which are half a delta x over 2 in extent on, at either end of the bar for applying the boundary conditions. It's an unsteady problem, and so we'll be solving this for each time step. So now we're going to put a superscript in on the temperatures at our three locations. So let's take this control volume, and we'll generate the, uh, the general equation in order to solve for the interior, all of the interior volumes. And we'll put the subscript n. And we're going to need to know the previous time in order to get the energy storage term. So what we're going to need is an initial condition. We're going to need a temperature at every point in this bar to start the process off the initial condition. condition. Then we can look at a generic time step n, where we always have the n minus 1 term in order to evaluate the, unsteady, the, the energy storage term. And of course, once we have, <coughs> once we have our time step n, we can always evaluate the n plus 1 time step using at the time before. So let's look at our generic interior volume, looking at a Ti at the n plus 1 time that we're solving for. Our conservation of energy equation, as always, is energy, the rate of energy in minus the rate of energy out, plus any energy that's generated, which we're assuming to be 0 in this derivation, is equal to the rate of change of energy stored within the volume. We're assuming there's no generation, so that term goes away. And we can look at this energy storage term. The energy storage term is why we need the previous time step. Of course, we have the volumetric heat capacity times the volume, which is the cross-sectional area, times the extent of this control volume, delta x. This quantity, the volume, times the volumetric heat capacity, has units of joules per kelvin. So we need to know how much energy it is to change it by a given temperature. That's the temperature at the time we're solving for, n plus 1, minus the temperature that it was at at the previous time step, ti at n. And that will give us the energy that's required to make that, that change. And if we divide by the time between these two steps, delta t, then that will turn it into a rate of energy, of power, or units of watts, which is what we need in our equation. So this is the description of that energy storage term in our conservation of energy. And we see that we need the temperature at the previous time step, and now we have a time step as well that we need to choose. Okay, so let's evaluate the E in term. That's, of course, we're using Fourier's law, and we're approximating with a, a first order approximation of the derivative, so we have Ti at <coughs> n plus 1, Ti minus 1 at n plus 1, divided by the spacing between them, delta x, multiplied by the cross-sectional area and minus the conductivity. E out is the same thing, okay? E out is the same thing, except that we're basing it on uh, that the next temperature minus the temperature at our volume. So we have this here using uh, Fourier's law. When we put that all together, now what I want to do, I have the energy in term minus the energy out term is equal to the energy storage term. And so now I want to put this into a matrix formulation so that I can build up the matrix to solve in order to get these temperatures. And so what I want to do is collect all the terms, all of the coefficients that multiply each of my unknown temperatures. I'm collecting those terms. I want to put it in the form at is equal to b so that I can solve this by taking the inverse of a and solving for the temperatures. So in this case, because we based our, and our derivative, our temperature gradient estimate on the point and the previous point for the energy in term and the next point and the current point for the energy out term, we have three temperatures in question, Ti, Ti minus 1, and Ti plus 1. So we want to collect the terms, multiplying each of our unknown temperatures. 
we can see that my t i minus 1 at time n plus 1 only appears once in the equation. And the coefficient is kac, negative and negative cancelling out. Similarly, if we collect the terms for ti, I have a minus kac over delta x here. I have minus, 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 so a minus kac over delta x here. And I have a rho cp ac delta x over delta t times a minus, uh, uh, times a positive ti n plus 1 here, which I need to bring over to this side, so it becomes negative as well. So I get 2 kac over delta x plus uh, that term there, multiplying my central temperature, ti n plus 1. And on the ti plus 1, we have a minus minus kac over delta x, so a positive kac over delta x. And over on the b side, we're still left with a rho cpac delta x over delta t times a negative ti at the previous time step. So on the b side, we're left with this coefficient here. Of course, I can arrange that into my matrix format, and we find that the, the, the central coefficient, the coefficient multiplying our control volume that we're solving for, is that longer one. And each adjacent temperature has a kac over delta x. And in our b term, we have that uh, fraction of the energy storage term there. So now this will work for all of the interior control volumes. In this example, there are five and two boundary control volumes that we'll have to look at next. Let's look first at the five interior ones. Of course, each one of these is one expression of conservation of energy. And so we can write conservation of energy five times for those five central volumes. That's the generic expression. And all we're doing is moving. If, if CV1, if we're looking at this one, now my I is equal to one. And my I minus one, of course, will be equal to zero. And my I plus one will be equal to two. When we look at this one, same thing. The I is equal to two. The I minus one is equal to one. The I plus one is equal to three. So we can populate our matrix for all five of these interior volumes. We'll leave the generic expression for the boundary condition for CV0. And conservation of energy for CV6 is the boundary condition. But we can populate all five of these interior ones with that expression that we just derived. So I've done that here. All we're doing is taking those three terms in the generic volume, and we're putting them in the right row for conservation of energy for volume one. The central coefficient was number one. The previous one is zero, and the subsequent one is one. And that just moves one down as we move down our matrix. So we see that we have the diagonal element always being the central coefficient, and the point previous one being the KAC over delta x, and the next one the KAC over delta x. So that populates uh, five of our seven rows of our matrix, and we now need to look at the boundary conditions in order to solve the entire system. So let's look first at CV0, or the boundary condition where we have a constant flux. So the energy coming in is that constant flux that we choose to specify times the cross-sectional area. The energy going out is minus KAC T1 at n plus 1 minus T0 at n plus 1 divided by delta x. And on the energy stored term, we have the same similar term as before, the volumetric heat capacity times the volume. And now this volume is as an extent delta x over 2. And so our volume is AC times delta x over 2. And we're talking about the temperature of point of control volume 0 at the n plus 1th time step minus the nth time step divided by delta t. So collecting the terms then, we see that we have only two temperatures involved in our conservation of energy expression for this volume. And here are the coefficients that we'll put in our matrix. For the zeroth element on the diagonal, we have this term. And for the first element, we have this term. And we have, from our boundary condition, this known heat flux, of course, moved over into the B side. And that's a known term, as well as the known part of the energy storage term. So we can populate the first row with this. There's our diagonal coefficient that we just derived. There's the coefficient for temperature 1. And there's our B side. Finally, we simply need to look at the convection boundary condition on the outlet side. Here, our En is, as it has been from Fourier's law, minus Kac times the unknown temperature at the end of the bar, minus the temperature in control volume 5 over delta x. Our convection coefficient, where we have the convection coefficient times the cross-sectional area times 
the, temp the unknown temperature at the end of the bar minus the ambient temperature. For our energy storage term, we have the volumetric heat capacity times the cross-sectional area times, or sorry, times the volume, which is the cross-sectional area, times the extent of our volume delta x over 2, uh, times our estimate of the time derivative of our 0.6. Collecting our terms as before, again, we have only two uh, temperatures involved in this conservation of energy equation. So we have the diagonal coefficient here from collecting our terms and one back from the diagonal and our boundary condition information appearing in addition to our energy storage uh, term in the B side of our matrix. So now we can populate our matrix there. Everything else was a zero. We have the one back term, KAC over delta X. We have our diagonal term and the B side put in here. And now our matrix is fully populated. And we have uh, all we need to know to solve this problem. Now, of course, solving this, we have to repeat the solution over and over. We need to start with the initial conditions to solve for time step one, and we simply solve our linear system for the unknown temperatures at n plus one, and then using our newly solved temperatures at time step n plus one, we can solve for the next time step and continue marching forward by solving this matrix for each and every time step. So here's, a, here's the header of a Python function that I've, run, I've written to do this, and we'll use it in subsequent videos.